the upright and conservative capital of South Australia. With a population of one million, it's known as the city of churches. But to the north of the city lie many neglected and impoverished suburbs that house much of Adelaide's underclass. In November 1998, married mother of seven, Elizabeth Hayden, disappears from her home in Salisbury North, one of the most deprived areas of the city. Elizabeth Hayden's husband, Mark, is asked to come to the local police station to give a statement and answer some questions from Detective Greg Stone. Mr Hayden, what's puzzling me is your wife Elizabeth goes missing. Now, the only reason we know she's missing is because her brother reported a disappearance to us. What I want to know is why you didn't report her missing. Look, a week ago, my mate John Bunting said that my wife Elizabeth made a pass at him and he knocked her back. The yeah, next day, you know, she'd gone. Mark Hayden's statement does not convince investigating officers, and they check out his version of events. John Bunting, a 32-year-old abattoir worker, corroborates Hayden's story. Chief Superintendent Dennis Edmonds remembers why his detectives were so suspicious. Her husband didn't seem to be all that concerned about where she was or where she might have gone. You get a gut feeling that something's not quite right. You're not sure what it is, but it's your job to find out what was going on. Officers are immediately alerted to a second name in Hayden's statement. So she left. The uh, next day, I went and stayed with my mate, Rob Wagner. Robert Wagner, 27 years old and unemployed, is already known to the police. In 1997, his homosexual partner, Barry Lane, was reported missing. Whilst checking Lane's bank accounts, police come across something suspicious. Jeremy Putney was a crime reporter working in Adelaide at the time. Police were able to ascertain that Barry Lane, who was missing but not necessarily dead in their eyes, uh, was regularly accessing his bank account, or if not him, someone else was. Police set up a surveillance camera and over the course of the next few months, were able to obtain vision of someone making withdrawals from Barry Lane's bank account. That person wasn't Barry Lane, it was Robert Wagner. Detectives Greg Stone and Steve McCoy urgently review every missing person's case on file and make a startling discovery. At least five of these disappearances were linked. Bunting and Wagner were the common denominators. Police can now closely connect three men to an astonishing list of missing persons in and around the north of Adelaide. Mark Hayden's wife, Elizabeth, missing. Robert Wagner's former partner, Barry Lane, missing. Clinton Tresize, also a former partner of Barry Lane, missing. And John Bunting's near neighbors, Suzanne Allen and Ray Davis, missing. As more and more missing persons cases were linked together, police started to apply significant amounts of pressure uh, to the group. They were under surveillance. They were very much under the police microscope, very much. We felt that we had enough information to go before a judge at the Supreme Court to apply for um, telephone interception. Debbie Marshall is a crime reporter who listened to the suspect's use of coded language. They're picking up these phone taps and they're hearing Bunting and Wagner use the most strange terms, things like, they need to go to the clinic, they need to be made good, it's time to play. As officers monitor the suspect's calls, other members of the 20-strong team hunt down an important piece of evidence in the case of Elizabeth Hayden. We were looking for a Land Cruiser four-wheel drive that she owned, and that car had gone missing. On the 18th of May, investigators follow Bunting and Wagner as they drive 100 miles north of Adelaide to a remote settlement called Snowtown. 
the two men unintentionally lead police straight to the piece of evidence that has proved elusive, Elizabeth Hayden's vehicle. It's a major breakthrough. A team of investigators is dispatched to Snowtown to examine the vehicle. Among them is experienced crime scene officer Gordon Drage. The idea was to seize the car, forensically examine the car, and see if there was any connection we could draw to the car and these missing people. It's empty, but the owner of the house tells detectives that the vehicle's contents have been moved across the street to a disused bank. Gordon. One of the detectives called me aside and said, you're not going to believe this, he said, but we've got to go across to the old state bank. The bank is a makeshift store for computers and electrical equipment, but officers are more interested in getting inside the vault. When we opened the door, we were confronted with a wall of black plastic that had been um, stuck with clear tape around the sides and a, a slit straight down the centre. Oh. Oh, stinks. Once we got in, the smell then was just overpowering. Um, we were dealing with some something dead. We've got six barrels in here, a few knives. I think that looks like a saw over here. Hydrochloric acid. There was that moment of, I've got to look, but I don't want to look. The first barrel contains human remains. I could see a hand and a foot. I would open each barrel in turn, and some just had soil and, and body parts, and others were almost full to the brim with, with a thick, sort of gooey liquid. Police will have to keep the sickening discovery from the world's press as they prepare to swoop on their prime suspects. The major crime unit of South Australia Police is investigating the disappearance of five missing persons in Adelaide. Following a trail of evidence over five months, officers have entered a disused bank vault to discover six barrels full of decomposing human remains. The bank is immediately declared a major crime scene. Chief Superintendent Dennis Edmonds has arrived in Snowtown. We took uh, a team of detectives and forensic investigators um, uh, up to Snowtown, set up a command base uh, at the police station. It is now a race against time. Investigators have to make sure the press don't get wind of the story. The last thing we wanted was the media to run a story that we were investigating something at Snowtown which would tip off these guys before we had a chance to, to grab them. On the 21st of May, 1999, the police move on their three prime suspects who have been under surveillance in five missing persons cases. In a dawn raid, officers arrest 32-year-old former abattoir worker John Bunting at his home. 27-year-old unemployed man Robert Wagner is also arrested. 41-year-old Mark Hayden is the third suspect arrested. It was his wife Elizabeth's disappearance five months previously which triggered the whole investigation. Police have also established that the disused bank is leased in Hayden's name. Whilst in custody, the men remain tight-lipped. Tonight, horrific details emerge of a massacre in the state's mid-north. Australia wakes up to breaking news of the sickening find in Snowtown. Came into the building, this door was closed, and uh, they just opened the door. This morning, the doors were open to the media. Cameras quickly focused on the bank's vault, where six large barrels containing decomposed human remains were discovered by major crime investigators on Thursday night. I've been a crime reporter for some time, but just like the police and Australian society, the Australian public, we were confronted by what people were capable of. Later that evening, news crews are desperate to get a glimpse of the three accused. The charge sheet alleges that the men murdered an unknown person. That's understood to be a holding charge while investigations continue. As Bunting walked from the dock to the holding cells, a large smile crossed his face. 
Forensic scientists now examine the decomposing remains within each barrel. With some of the remains soaked in acid, identification could be difficult and hazardous. But remarkably, this crude attempt to destroy evidence could assist the investigation, according to forensic anthropologist Machi Henneberg. These bodies were put into hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, besides dissolving the mineral from the bud, does preserve, does not dissolve them. So they actually preserve those bodies for us to study. As they decant and piece together the dismembered body parts, scientists quickly establish that the six barrels contain the remains of eight bodies. The forensic process has barely begun when the investigation takes another devastating turn. On the 22nd of May, one day after the arrests, police receive an anonymous call. We got certain information that there may be two victims buried in the backyard of a house at Salisbury. That house had previously been rented by John Bunting. Two bodies are discovered, bringing the victim count to 10. Police are no clearer of their motive, as the three men in custody are saying nothing. The police are under pressure to provide answers. They focus their attention on a 19-year-old man called James Vlasakis. He is the son of John Bunting's partner and lived at the same address at Waterloo Corner Road. Vlasakis' behavior combined with things people around him said to police basically led police to the conclusion that he had some sort of involvement. Taken into custody, Vlasakis talks, but he is terrified. I haven't told anyone this because I didn't want to get killed. Vlasakis tells about how Bunting had bragged about killing a young man in the early 90s. Mike, just go in the lounge room, sit down. Can I put the TV on? Yeah, sure, mate. Be my guest. But Vlasakis cannot provide a name for what police believe is Bunting's first victim. John Bunting started off as any one-off killer might do, but he basically loaded the remains into a car, drove out to a paddock in the middle of nowhere and dumped them. Matching crucial details of the killing against post-mortem reports on remains found on a farm near Lower Light in 1996, three years earlier, police identify the victim as a 22-year-old drifter, Clinton Tresize. Clinton Tresize was a disillusioned young man. He had very few friends, if any. He had irregular contact with his family and was a very lonely young man. And it made him the perfect target for John Bunting. For police, it's crucial evidence but they also begin to piece together a dark world on the margins of respectable Adelaide. Jamie Vlasakis had been sexually abused throughout his childhood by his half-brother Troy and by a neighbor, Geoffrey Payne. When Vlasakis was 14, John Bunting began a relationship with his mother, Elizabeth. Whilst in custody, Vlasakis is assessed by psychiatrist Paul Mullen. Bunting began a relationship uh, with Vlasakis, his mother, and he really moved into the role for this young adolescent uh, of a father, a father uh, that he had never known. The young Vlasakis became enthralled. Through Vlasakis, investigators gained their first insight into the character of John Bunting and how he boasted of his violent acts, including murder. John told me parts of what they did. I believe that if I told someone, John would kill me. Someone who knew Bunting well is Vlasakis' stepfather, Marcus Johnson. He was the most unusual man I'd ever met. He was very intelligent and he had a tremendous manipulative ability. In the home he shared with his partner, Elizabeth Harvey, at 203 Waterloo Corner Road, Bunting would hold court with his inner circle of Robert Wagner, Mark Hayden, and Jamie Blasakis. 
and pedophiles. They are on every single street corner. The place is crawling with them everywhere. He didn't drink very much. He had the wherewithal, however, to get people to sit around him and to listen to his every word. He was described, uh, Vlasakis, as charismatic, as just someone who evoked admiration. Hey, should have seen this fag on Bast in Queensland, eh? <laughs> hey. Oh, mate. I say, hey, mate, you'd be a faggot, wouldn't you? <laughs> just like that, right? Yeah. So he goes me, flinched, too late, sunshine. <laughs> BAM! <laughs> Oh, mate, you should have seen him, mate. He, he just dropped like a sack of spuds. Like a teeth. I knocked his teeth out, mate. Oh, yeah, but he deserved like it, eh? Oh, yeah. He deserved it. Yeah. Of course he deserved it. Yeah. They all deserved it. Yeah. Bang! <laughs> <laughs> he was frightening. He was intimidating. People were either with him or against him, and if they were against him, they were frightened for their lives. Vlasakis reveals to investigators that five years after Bunting committed his first killing in 1992, he was ready to kill again, and this time, he had a willing partner in crime. Robert Wagner is not a very articulate, not a very uh, strong, forceful personality, yet he had a very dark side to him. Both men moved on their next target, 26-year-old Ray Davis, a disturbed and intellectually impaired man and a near neighbor of Bunting. You lot the present I bought you? When Ray Davies was abducted, he was taken back to the home that John Bunting shared with Elizabeth Harvey. And it was there that he was finally murdered, strangled to death. The body of Ray Davis is dumped in a hole in Bunting's backyard and is later excavated by police. A female victim buried alongside him is Suzanne Allen, a former fiance of Davis. Police are still trying to find a motive for the killings. But they discover that a week after his death, Ray Davis's caravan is sold, and evidence seized at Bunting's home proves that he accessed the bank accounts of both victims. They would often demand from victims their personal security numbers and access their bank accounts, and so conceal the crime afterwards so he could keep killing and he could keep hunting within his own circle. Almost a year after the killing of Ray Davis, Bunting and Wagner choose their next victim from their neighborhood, 19-year-old Michael Gardiner. Police speak to mother of two, Nicole Zurita, a close friend of Gardiner. The last time I saw Michael, um, I was heading to New South Wales for a um, short holiday, and he was going to stay in my house until I got back. When I came home, um, Michael was gone and, and so were my belongings. Police are now beginning to gather evidence of a more sinister motive behind these killings. Bunting would keep this wall of spiders, as he referred to it, which was a series of post-it notes linked by strings of wool. With names of people and addresses of people that Bunting believed should be punished. Those who needed to be punished were paedophiles and homosexuals. Bunting made no distinction between them. He found pedophiles hiding under everything, and his speech pattern was always in a violent context, and it was always, always about pedophiles. Dirty, you dirty, you are disgusting. What we know about Bunting's background is he grew up in an impoverished area in Queensland with a very conservative mother and a very uptight father. He then moved to Adelaide when he was 18 and he moved to the same down and out areas that he was used to in his childhood. There's some evidence that suggests that he was raped as a boy, but he hardly spoke of it and certainly didn't use it in his rantings, probably because of his shame. <laughs> 
was obviously driven by some very perverse and dreadful desires. Investigators know that Bunting influenced Robert Wagner, but firm evidence is needed to establish the extent of Wagner's involvement. Dr. Jack White worked with Wagner whilst he was in custody. He saw Bunting as a, a leader-like character, somebody he would respect and somebody he would be a soldier for. Wagner would join Bunting's crusade, but when he first met him, he was in a homosexual relationship. Robert Wagner had been picked up by pedophile and transvestite Barry Lane when Robert Wagner was 14 years old. He basically took him and spirited him away and kept him into adulthood. He's confused and deranged in his own mind, but there was no confusion in John Bunting's mind. He believed that Wagner was a victim and it was his job to get him away from Lane, and that's exactly what he did. When Lane started talking about what he suspected Bunting and Wagner were doing, he sealed his own fate. Couldn't get your bloody mouth shut! Quicker! Robert Wagner loved the thrill of the torture, but he was also the one who was strong enough to come up behind the victim and put his massive arms around the victim's neck and start to strangle him just enough. <laughs> they often brought their victims back just at the point of unconsciousness for John Bunting to move in and look into their eyes, which is what he loved to do most, and impose his power. Shortly after the death of Barry Lane in late 1997, a young man was found hanged from a tree at Kersbrook, north of Adelaide. The body was that of 18-year-old schizophrenic Thomas Trevilian, a former partner of Lane. The death of Mr. Trevelyan wasn't investigated by major crime to start with because um, it appeared to be a suicide by hanging. Vlasakis now reveals that the death was no suicide, but the result of the killer's growing bloodlust. The motive here was John Bunting's warped hatred for these people. And it became a lust for murder. He wanted to kill people. He was eventually just looking for the right sort of person to kill. Further revelations from Vlasakis will reveal how the murders accelerate and how he was lured by Bunting into a deadly circle of killers. Following the discovery of eight bodies in barrels in a disused bank on the 20th of May 1999, three men have been charged with murder, John Bunting, Robert Wagner and Mark Hayden. I guess we all sensed then that this was likely to be certainly one of the biggest, um, highest profile crimes in Australia and possibly the world. Another man, 19-year-old Jamie Vlasakis, is in police custody, providing details of the killing, crucial evidence for the prosecution. The only reason I kept this light going is because he could do it to me. The confessions of James Vlasakis became quite crucial in terms of understanding what had happened, why it had happened, who'd done what, and how to gather the evidence that was required to bring uh, Bunting, uh, Wagner and Hayden in some form to trial. With the help of Vlasakis, police have identified six victims. Clinton Tresize, Ray Davis, Suzanne Allen, Michael Gardiner, Barry Lane and Thomas Trevelyan. The motives behind the killings are becoming clearer. John Bunting targeted Michael Gardner because he was gay. And purely and simply for that reason only, um, they associated gay with pedophilia. This place is full of poofters and pedophiles. They are on every single street corner. The place is crawling with like rock spiders, stinking pedophiles everywhere. I should then need a little visit to the clinic. They need to be punished. As Vlasakis continues his statement to police, he also gradually reveals how he was further lured into the dark circle of killing. James Vlasakis says he went out one evening, came back, Bunting and Wagner were there, and showed him the body of Gavin Porter. 
on the ground in the shed out the back and they told him that they'd murdered him. Gavin Porter was a close friend of Lasakis and, like him, a heroin addict. Bunting hated drug addicts and regarded them as waste. Vlasakis was obviously shocked, stunned. It was his friend. He was frightened. He believed at that moment that Bunting and Wagner were about to kill him. He was basically frightened, intimidated and implicated from that point on. Throughout the days giving crucial information to investigators, Vlasakis tells of how the killers were now joined by their friend, Mark Hayden. I'm on one side of the road. He's Mark Hayden the was a very oh, inarticulate oh, man who obviously could be so easily manipulated. If Bunting said something had to be done, it had to be done. The ordeal of cataloguing the deaths is traumatic for Vlasakis. He can barely manage to cope as he recalls every horrific detail. But he will shock officers as he recounts how he progressed from bystander to killer, beginning with the murder of his half-brother, Troy Ude. Robert and John were just shuffling Troy into the bathroom. I thought he was just going to be bashed. Troy Ude had raped Jamie right through his childhood. He, as Jamie had, had grown up in this household of frank abuse with a mother who was psychiatrically ill. I thought he was just going to be bashed, given a talking to. Jamie told John Bunting that Troy had sexually abused him and that was virtually the death warrant of Troy. What are you doing? <laughs> they took him into the bathroom and they started yelling and screaming. What are you doing? What's happening? Calling him a faggot and a baby rapist and things like that. Troy Ude endured shocking forms of torture for a substantial period of time before he died, and James Lasaka stood there over him while this happened. And in fact, Troy Ude, his brother, is appealing to him as he's being tortured and killed. What's going on? Why are they doing this to me? He was losing consciousness. John turned around to Troy and he said, this was fun. I could do this all day. This is fun. I could do this all day. I remember walking down the hallway again. I couldn't handle it. I said to him that I enjoyed it. I didn't. And the only reason I kept the lie going because I didn't want John to kill me. He was shattered mentally, a mess. He was at breaking point. He was a drug user. He'd been controlled by John Bunting <laughs> and attempted suicide as police were starting to interview him as a suspect. <laughs> he was just a broken person who didn't have the ability to stop what was going on, didn't have the courage to stop what was going on, and ultimately believed that he was about to be a victim at any moment. The killings have accelerated, with the last five murders carried out between November 1997 and September 1998. The killer's frenzied desire for death only increases. They actually sat round tables and talked about murdering people like we would talk about what the weather is like. I got my eye on that one around the corner. He's just about due a visit, I reckon. The next killings of Fred Brooks, a mentally handicapped young man, and Gary O'Dwyer, a local disabled man, followed within six weeks and are notable for their prolonged torture. Some of the torture was horrific. John Bunting obtained a voltage variac device, basically an electrocution tool where he could turn up the amount of current that was going into someone. <laughs> With the victim count increasing, their remains were stored in barrels, the very act of which, for psychologists involved in the case, provides a disturbing insight to the mind of John Bunting. I think with Bunting, there's clearly an, a fascination uh, with dead bodies. He retains these bodies, not simply to prevent them being found, because if anything is going to risk them being found, it's retaining them. 
uh, but because of his need to keep control even over the dead bodies and to still keep them available to serve his fascination. Mark Hayden has remained silent during his time in custody. His wife Elizabeth's disappearance in November 1998 triggered the whole investigation. But through Vlasakis, police discover that the barrels were stored in Hayden's garage. And they also discover how Hayden made the mistake of telling his wife Elizabeth too much. Her husband was storing bodies in barrels in the shed in their backyard. John Bunting was looking for people to kill by now. There's no doubt that Elizabeth Hayden knew some of what had happened, if not all of what had happened, and that was enough to mean that she would be targeted next. Despite the killer's efforts to conceal Elizabeth Hayden's disappearance, it was investigated immediately by police. Elizabeth Hayden was really the turning point in terms of the investigation and the intensity of the pressure on this group of killers. For the first time, the three men would come under close scrutiny. It caused John Bunting to panic a little bit. The bodies in barrels that he'd been storing in Mark Hayden's garage, he hastily moved. All of this created a trail. The barrels were eventually moved to a disused bank two hours north of Adelaide in Snowtown. Despite an increasing and uncomfortable police presence around the suspects, the killings did not stop. Bunting towards the end of the killing was getting more and more of a high just through the pleasure of, of killing someone and the power it gave him. Vlasakis tells how Bunting asked him to lure a young man to Snowtown. That young man, neither homosexual or a paedophile, is Vlasakis's stepbrother, 24-year-old David Johnson, Marcus Johnson's son. David was a very good young man who had never been in trouble with the police. He was clean cut, he was well dressed and well behaved in everything he did and he did not deserve anything like he got. He was lured to his death by Jamie Vasakis at John Bunting's insistence. And we have tapes which were played to the court and it's spine chilling to hear them. Bunting waiting in the vault at Snowtown as Jamie Vlasakis brings his prey along that lonely road. Bunting's on the phone to Vlasakis saying, this is the voice of happiness and Vlasakis saying, ha ha, we're on our way. It's just down here. It's a heap of Hey, David! How you going, guys? We know that when David doing? Johnson actually entered the vault, he was confused, as you would be. Yeah. Put him down, Robert! <laughs> Good. He was panicking and his legs were shaking, just shaking. Hold him down, Robert! Get over me! Robert, hold him down! <laughs> he was looking around, but he didn't know what was going on. He was obviously in a lot of pain. <laughs> Aside from the horrifying torture, Vlasakis reveals to police that the killing of David Johnson marked the last taboo for Wagner and Bunting. Vlasakis watched both men eat a section of flesh from their last victim. There had been some cannibalism. These people I knew, and I actually sat down and ate with them, and to think they've eaten my son, that's an indescribable feeling. So he had rituals. I mean, the most extreme ritual uh, was the eating together of the flesh of the victim. And they were now tied together by mutual guilt and at one, at one with each other. On the 2nd of June, 1999, after six traumatic days giving evidence to police, <laughs> James Vlasakis is charged with murder. His testimony is crucial in the case against his fellow killers, on July the 2nd, John Bunting, Robert Wagner and Mark Hayden are jointly charged with 10 counts of murder. 
the whole of Australia awaits the most shocking trial in the country's criminal history. As the public reel at the horrific details of the killings, the country is rocked by the revelation that Bunting could have been caught after his first murder. Four men are awaiting trial for a series of horrific murders in South Australia. All 12 murder victims were known to the four accused and all lived in the same deprived ghettos of North Adelaide. The bodies in the Barrels trials begin in 2001. It'll be a massive undertaking. It was complex, it was demanding. It took a big slice out of police officers' uh, careers. On the 21st of June, 2001, Jamie Vlasakis appears in court to face four charges of murder. It is his confession to police that forms the basis of the entire prosecution case. It was a secret deal that had been brokered for some weeks and he appeared in court unexpectedly and pleaded guilty to four of the five murders for which he'd been charged. Vlasakis pleads guilty to four charges of murder. For his part in the murders of his half-brother, Troy Ude, Fred Brooks, Gary O'Dwyer, and his stepbrother, David Johnson, Vlasakis is sentenced to 26 years in prison. Throughout, he was horrified by the killing, but he was caught up in Bunting's world. It took months and months of physical separation before he escaped from that world and woke up one morning to the full horror of what he'd been part of. Vlasakis returns to court to take the stand for 32 days to testify against his co-accused. It helps to have a star witness when you're trying serial killers. And in return for that, he gets out of jail one day. Mark Hayden pleads not guilty to two counts of murder and five of assisting offenders. He will be tried separately. Mark Hayden was the monosyllabic sidekick who just did what he was told. He had his own trial and he just sat staring at the floor. The murder charges against Hayden are dropped, but he is found guilty on all counts of assisting offenders. He is dismissed by the judge as a passive manservant and sentenced to 25 years in prison. In October 2002, the trial of Robert Wagner and John Bunting begins. Robert Wagner, charged with 11 counts of murder, pleads guilty to three and not guilty to the remaining charges. John Bunting pleads not guilty to 12 counts of murder. They say they were killing pedophiles, people who would harm children, when in actual fact, most of their victims were simply people who weren't as privileged as others or whose lives had in some way gone off the rails. The world hears the full appalling detail of each killing. The prosecution plays to the jury recordings made by the killers during their torture sessions. It proves traumatic for all those who attend. I was haunted by the voices of the victims screaming for mercy and receiving none. And it played over and over in my mind. I had nightmares and I know a lot of people did. Marcus Johnson has to endure listening to the recordings of his son, David, being tortured. It was a very, very, very emotionally strange, indescribable time to have to, to sit there and know that he was under such terrible stress and strain that no human being should go through. Despite the prosecution revealing the victim's suffering, there is no emotion from the accused. I've watched John Bunting and Robert Wagner in the dock and I haven't seen one glimmer of remorse in either of them. In September 2003, the verdicts are announced. Robert Wagner is found guilty of 10 murders. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars for his compulsive desire to kill. I think it was almost like a drug and uh, he longed to get that feeling uh, and I think that's what perhaps uh, kept the killing going. John Bunting is found guilty of 11 murders. The jury fails to reach a verdict on the cause of death of one of the victims, Suzanne Allen. Along with Wagner, he will never be released from prison. I have never, ever in my career as a crime writer come across the likes of Robert Wagner and John Bunting. 
I sat just metres from them in court, watching particularly John Bunting, smirking, loving it. And I remember thinking at one point, if ever there was the devil, he was sitting just metres from me here. The case is closed. Four men are in jail and 12 victims are dead. But could the killings have been stopped earlier? Forensic anthropologist Matty Henneberg believes mistakes were made. The case could have been solved earlier and therefore the death of some other victims prevented. In 1994, the remains of Bunting's first victim, Clinton Tresize, were discovered. Despite a nationwide appeal, it was five years before the remains were identified. If we'd been able to identify the, the skeletal remains as Tresize, police would have been making inquiries then with all of Tresice's associates. You could almost be certain that Bunting and Wagner would have been spoken to by police. Professor Henneberg was asked by police to help identify the remains. Inexplicably, he was never given the only existing photo of Tresize, which he is confident he could have matched accurately to the skull. If we know, for example, the, that certain people are missing and we have their photographs and then we find one skull, we can do by image mixing, superimposition of the skull into the photograph, and skull will fit only one face. That error meant that police didn't investigate initially Clinton Tresize's disappearance as a murder, and that probably meant that John Bunting wasn't investigated as a suspect early on and allowed his activities, his killings, to continue. This snowballed into Australia's worst serial killing when it could have been just a single case of murder. Australia's worst serial killing has left an indelible mark on those involved in the case. The Snowtown story may have ended for people, but for people like myself who covered it, it will never end. When you find out that somebody you care about is not only dead, but has been tortured simply because they were a little different. You know, why? For those touched by the tragedy, the horrors will never recede. I carry my grief. I don't look upon myself as a normal human being. I just can't. I find it extraordinarily hard to trust people. I don't think I ever can.